Hi everybody, Jim here, and today I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about Saplicity. If you're watching this video, then chances are you've heard rumors about a free suite of recyclable VBA code that empowers people to perform mass loads into SAP using nothing but Excel. Well, before I give you a demo and a primer on how the VBA code works, let me first extol some of the virtues of Saplicity. Sure enough, Saplicity is already forward compatible with S4. It's backwards compatible to R3, but you can use it with S4 when that comes out to wherever you're working, if you're not already working with it. Saplicity works without any additional software being installed on the SAP server, so there's no reason to bother your basis team to get them to install proprietary software. There's no requirement for proprietary software to be installed on the desktop. If you have Excel and SAP GUI, then Saplicity will work for you. The tools that you download, update, or create using Saplicity are easily distributed to the rest of your team and don't require any additional licensing for those people to use it. It's just an Excel spreadsheet that you can email or post on a file share, and once they have it, they can use it for as long as they have it. Saplicity, unlike the other guys, doesn't require an initial licensing fee. It doesn't require a recurring annual licensing fee. It's completely free. If you want to spend tens of thousands of dollars to do the exact same thing, then you should buy the other guy's software. But if you want to do everything that I'm about to show you for free, then download this software and use it. Let's have a quick demonstration and I'll show you what I mean as to how easy it is to use. Let's start by downloading this software. Great. Now, the first time you launch Saplicity, it's going to give you a warning because, hey, this just came from the internet. And it makes perfect sense that the software would warn you about that. There it is. Be careful. Vi files from the internet can contain viruses. It's true, they can. I need to edit this, so I'm going to enable editing. And it's going to throw up another warning and, of course, block macros, which is right and true. Uh, and if your IT guys are anything like me, they're going to look at you when you say to them, hey, I've downloaded a an Excel spreadsheet from the internet with embedded VBA code, and I want to use it in conjunction with the company's sandboxes and production SAP servers. They're going to say, hey, let me look at it first. Well, they can, and here's how they do it. Before enabling any VBA code or macros, click on Developer, click on Visual Basic, and there it is, all the code, plain and simple, in open source. Nothing is hidden. There's no proprietary libraries. There's no executables. It's just this VBA code. And in this case, there's a second sheet with some languages, and I'll show you that in a moment, and a workbook. But all of the VBA code is here. Those green lines are remarks, and the remainder the other two-thirds is about 300 lines of very simple VBA code, and I'll touch on that later too. Let's see how this works. Now you'll notice that the enable macros warning is gone. That doesn't mean that the macros are enabled, uh, they're still disabled. So in order to enable the macros, I'm going to save this, but before I save it, I'm going to paste in some sample data for the purpose of this test, and then I'll save it. And here, because I've cleaned out all of my personal information from this file before I posted it on the internet, it's warning me that the document may have some personal information that can't be removed. Okay, great. So I launch it again. And it's not going to warn me about this having come from the internet. You've already gotten that warning, but it's still disabled the macros. So I'm going to enable that here for the purpose of the demonstration. I need to put in an SAP server there, just like that. And then I can click the upload button and it will put, it will first open up SAP, collect my credentials, and then 
apply these sales texts accordingly based upon these ISO languages. This is a really simple tool. You just have the material number, the sales org, the distribution channel, and then the language in ISO code. And here I've deliberately put XX, which I know is not a valid ISO code. Additionally, 04 in this machine is not a valid distribution channel. So I should get an error in each case here. Let's see. It's going to throw up a warning, letting me know that a script is attempting to access SAP GUI. And I'm going to go, okay, that's fine. And a second warning letting me know that a, the script is trying to connect to Q01. Okay, that's great too. It throws it open. And here I'm going to type in my credentials. And as soon as I hit enter here, it's going to go very quickly, but you'll be able to see what's happening. It's clicking on the button on the left when there is a language and then applying the text change where that but after that button has been pressed. Now, if the language doesn't already exist in the material master, it will click the new button, add that language from the drop down list, and then add the text. Watch and see. I'm going to close this or minimize it so you can see what's happening. There we go. All right, just select it selected German. And yeah, it just added Spanish. And over on the left, you'll notice that it's throwing up a, a, the messages that it's getting from SAP here to let you know what's what, what has happened. And just there, it explained that entry 04, this distribution channel, doesn't exist in this check table. Additionally, ISO code XX does not exist, so that's that's not available. Well, great. Let's see if I can change a couple of these. Now, the, just now, you witnessed me add them. I'm going to update these and I'm going to change this to an exclamation point. And in this one, just add a couple of dots, just like that. On the left here in column A, I'm going to remove these two cells. I'm going to clear them out and I'll tell you why. Column A is where not only the message from SAP is stored, but the software, this VBA code, when it's stepping through all of these records, knows to pick up where it left off when these are blank. So if your VBA, or I'm sorry, if your VPN connection drops during uh, one of these uh, loads and you come back or wake up the next day, you can pick up right where you left off instead of trying to uh, doctor the data, do an extract, and then perform some sort of delta. No, it knows these haven't been done yet. So here I'm going to first close the window that I just had open, just like that, yes, and hit upload again. So it will go open up this material master, go to the sales text view, put in these sales area data, pick this language and put an exclamation point at the end. Okay, okay. Again, it's requesting credentials. There. there, and it added the two dots at the end of the German sales texts. So now I'm going to show you one more neat feature with this tool. Thank you. I'm going to clear out all of these and clear out all of these. And now I'm going to download the sales texts. And it's as simple as just clicking download. Yep. And there it goes. 
So if you have a lot of sales texts and you want to tease them out of the system to make some subtle changes and then load them again, this is a great tool for that. Here I'm only doing eight records because it's just a demo, but you can do this with up to a million records. And as you can see, it goes pretty quickly. What is that? Two, three, four seconds a piece? That's not too bad. Let me close this. Yes, completed. And sure enough, it gave me the same errors as before, language not available, and the distribution channel doesn't exist. But it teased out of the system the values that were there as sales texts in the material master. You notice something odd here. When I loaded this sales text, it had a space between this and software. But now there's a hidden carriage return, I'll show you. And I'm going to click up and down arrow to show you the two lines here and press enter. When I when the software teased this value out of the sales text, it teased it out as SAP presented it with a carriage return and not with a space. It's just a fun artifact of SAP and something to watch out for when you're dealing with sales texts and long texts for SAP. Well, that was a great demo of the sales text load tool. Let's see if we can do some plant updates. Let me go back to the website and I'm going to download this tool. And it's going to throw the same warning message about having freshly come from the internet as the one before. Mm -hmm. And it gives you the same message about macros having been disabled. I'm going to enable the content. And now I'm going to put in some simple test data. In a previous demo, I used this file to update the plant specific material status, but today I'm going to update the MRP type. Just like that. Great. And I'm going to pick the name of the SAP server. One. And just like before, hit the proceed button. It's going to open up SAP, throw the warnings. Let me put in my credentials. Oh, there it's gone through all of the screens when realistically I could have just picked one. or a few. Watch this. Because I didn't uh, put in any data about the PSTAT, it shows by default all of the plant-related views in the Material Master. Here's a, a list of the letters you can put into PSTAT in order to predict which view will pop up. And I'm going to go and just do the same thing again, but only calling the MRP view. Let's try that. I'm going to delete this so that it thinks it hasn't been done yet. I'm going to close the window I had open before and then proceed again. So in this case, it only pulled open the MRP views and it went much, much faster. So if you're doing a, a hundred thousand or a million of these and you don't want to spend 20 seconds, but instead want to spend only five, six seconds on each record, then you'll want to put in a particular PSTAT value such that it only pulls up the views that you want to update. Well, let's close this and I will give you a primer on how the VBA code works. Let's start by throwing open the VBA code. 
and setting a breakpoint such that the debugger will launch right after we create the session. Now the session is where everything is happening. Realistically, it's happening in the windows under the session, but this is as deep as we're going to go. So here you'll see that a series of objects are being created one after another, starting with an OLE connection to SAP GUI, and then pulling out the scripting engine and setting it here as an object. And then from the script engine, pulling open a connection. And from the connection, we're getting the session that we're going to use to do the work of mass loading into SAP. Let's see what happens when we run this now. All right, yes, I want to open the SAP GUI. Yes, that's fine. All right, so there's the debugger. And let's see if I can get this on the screen and the SAP GUI at the same time. Perfect. So in the session, I'm going to bring this object and look at the attributes of this object here. And when I expand this, it'll throw a warning. Yeah, yeah, I get it. And let's scroll up a hair here and we'll scroll this up to about here and we can get a good look at what's happening with the session. Now there's not much here to see, but you'll notice that the session is it's here. It's Q01 and its name is SES open bracket zero close bracket. And it's underneath the scripting engine or application and then the connection that we pulled open and then this session that we pulled open. That's uh, the hierarchical format. These forward slashes, they're just like your Unix directory browsing. So when you type in ls or look for the directory, the entries in a directory, you can put in the slash or you can start with the uh, records or the uh, objects underneath the session, the children of the session. And the way you would do that is with this find by ID function. And I could put in this text verbatim and I would find this session and then another slash with wind zero, but I don't want to do that. I just want to put in wind zero and then whatever objects are underneath wind zero in the children. So let's look at the children underneath this session this child, sorry, this session has one child, count one. And here's that child. And this child is called wind zero or window zero. And you can see again, this hierarchical format of the ID, just like that, very simple stuff. And this window has children. So let's have a guess at what these children are. Here's the window. And uh, up at the top here, you have a menu bar, and below that you have a, t a toolbar, and then you have some miscellaneous objects here to let you know you're using SAP and to offer a new password. And then you have a user area where you would typically do the work. And then down at the bottom, there's a status bar. And this is where the system messages, warning messages, and error messages appear. Those will come in later, and I'll, I'll give you a demonstration of how those are used. Let's look at these children. There are six. The first one is called in bar or menu bar. Uh, let's see if let's see what's underneath menu bar. We've got some children, and there are three. They're likely user, system, and help. The first one is called user. The second one is called system. And the third one is called help. And these each have children under them, which are more menu options. And those likely have children under them. But the first one is log on. So under user, the first one's log on, then new password, and then of course, log off. Okay, so we've played enough with the menu. Let's go to the next one, this toolbar, and the tool, the toolbar, sure enough, T bar, and it's a of type GUI toolbar. It has children. 
let's have a guess at what this first child is. Child one is button zero. And it's called button zero. And you can see again this hierarchical format of how the ID works. Let's see. The, this is a type GUI button. That's the object type. And the tooltip for this is enter. So if I come over here and I hover over this, sure enough, you get enter. All right, let's back up just a little bit more. And we're going to look at item five. Now, typically, the user area is the fifth item in the window. And you can see it's called USR. And it doesn't have any brackets, it's just USR. And then under it, there are some children. So I'm going to guess that the first child is client, this actual text, and then a field called whatever this is with the value 528. Let's look and see. Children, item one is called rsystmount, and you can see its ID there, and the displayed text is client, and it's Let's see if there's a text. Sure enough, client. Let's look at the second item. All right. Here the name of this is, again, rsystmount, but this object is called a GUI text field instead of a display field or whatever the last one was. Let's look, and, let's look at that and see what kind of object that was. GUI label. Okay. So item two is a GUI text field and the text in it is 528, and here's its ID and its name, and you can see that this one is editable or changeable. Let's see. Yeah, there it is. Changeable, tr true. It's not grayed out. You can put whatever you want there. Great. All right, that's the user area. And then down here, you have something called S bar or the status bar, and it's of type. GUI status bar, and you'll notice it's got a text and a message type. Now, this is where any messages from the programs are going to be displayed, and you have three types of messages. Uh, the three that I've encountered are system messages, which are the yellow icon, and then warning messages, which are green, I think. And then error messages, which have the red stop sign. And whenever you run into an error message, and this message type is the letter E instead of S or W, when it's the letter E, you want to capture the text from the status bar and put that in column A of the spreadsheet to let their user know what error message was encountered. And then, of course, move on to the next record. Let's proceed a little further. I'm going to put a breakpoint right about here, and we're going to log in and then move on to the rest of the code. All right. Okay, great. So the session hasn't changed much, I bet. Uh, this is the session from the function we were just in. Let's look at the session again here, and it's going to give us a warning. Thank you. And the session still has just one child. Uh, it's count one, item number, window zero, and now there are different objects. They're mostly the same. The, the menu has changed. The toolbar has changed a little. The user area certainly has changed. And then again, the status has changed a little. Let's proceed down to where it is starting to affect some changes onto the Material Master. So for a lot of you, this is going to be a, uh, the first time maybe you've seen VBA. This is going to be a primer on VBA. And uh, for the rest of you, you're probably pretty familiar with VBA. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time getting you up to speed with VBA. There's a for next, some if and then statements, and then calling some functions wherein I pass some values down. Oh, you know what's happened is 
it went ahead and completed because I didn't clear this out. <laughs> let's do this again. <clears throat> okay, great. Let's give this a second try. All right, I'm going to press the F8 key. That's NVBA stepping to the next line of code. And here, I am going to be populating some field data, particularly this OK code right here, and then clicking this button. Watch this. Here's where it makes a determination on what views to use. This is pretty simple VBA code, so I'm not going to waste a lot of time going through this. And we're going to step down to, oh, where are we stepping down to? Let's go to here, where I'm going to call another function that passes the session we're using, the material number, the PSTAT value that we, we decided upon, and then the T code. Great. All right, it's a little more work on the views on which we want to use, but we're going to we're going to cruise right down to this line of code. Now watch this. Okay, so here we're going to find underneath the session window under the toolbar something called OK code, and that's this field right here. Watch what happens when I F8 past this line. It throws in this value right up here, and if you remember, there's this button and it's under Windows 0 on the toolbar called button 0, and I'm going to call the press function right now. Great. It moves to the next screen, and I'm going to skip this wait. Well, I guess not. There. And now on this window, there's again the user area and a field called ctext rmmg one matner and I'm going to set the text of that to this material number. And then I'm going to press this button again. Great, and it's prompted me for the views that I want. All right, uh, because there is no warning message, I don't have to press enter, and it's, there's no error message on this status bar down here, right? Here, there's no status message, so it's going to skip past these. All right, and now it's going to go through this window one. Now you can't, it's not very intuitive, but there are two windows now. There's this original window and this select views window. And this is a complete window that even though you can't see the menu bar and the toolbar, they're there, and I'll, I'll show you those in a second. So each one of these objects, uh, each one of these view options is an object, and they're stored in Windows 0 underneath its children. There's that children 1 underneath children 0, which is this uh, GUI object, container object. There are these children, and I'm going to step through them all one at a time, and if the text associated with the view is in this, let's see, string views, then it's going to be selected. But if it's not in there, it's going to be unselected. And by unselected and selected, I mean that that view is going to be true or false. All right, let's 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 walk through this. I wish you could see. Yeah, that's easier. Great. All right, so it's stepping through. In a moment, it'll it'll tag the MRP view. There's MRP one, MRP two, MRP three, and MRP four. All right, so we've gotten to the bottom of these fourteen objects in this list, so it's going to scroll down, and by scrolling down, it's going to directly address this vertical scroll bar, which it, it took me a minute to find this, and then figure out how to put a value in this position. In this case, there are 14, so if I set this position value to the number of children that are displayed, it'll do a complete page down, and 
throw the next object underneath MRP4, which I can't currently recall. But if there are fewer than 14, for example, if you have some non-valuated stock that's just a placeholder for something, then it'll have fewer views. And if you set this to the number of objects that are currently displayed, it will show only the very last object. So I'm going to step past this. There we go. It's scrolled down and now the remainder are visible and it's going to go through again. It won't select any of these because we're only looking at MRP views currently. But we'll go through it. Great. Uh, we got four selected, so you know we're good. And here, uh, we're not going to hit the cancel button. Again, I, you can't see the toolbar here, but it's there. So in this window one, as opposed to window zero, there, there's a toolbar with a button zero, and we're about to press it. Great. Now it's looking for the organization levels. And here's where it pulls the organization levels from the spreadsheet. So here it's getting the plant and the storage location. And then it's going to go through this new window, which again is called window one, and populate the fields. So I'm going to cut this uh, explanation of the VB code, VBA code short here because it may be getting pretty boring. And you can step through this at home yourself and get a really good feel for how this works by yourself. And if you have a test system or a sandbox, you can develop this code as you please. I'm going to be producing more of these objects as I go. In fact, I'm going to be creating in the very near future one that modifies the descriptions of the material master, which is pretty difficult in LSMW, uh, one that extends the warehouse view, and then one that copies plant extensions uh, from donor material masters with the appropriate values in their plant extensions. It's going to be pretty easy, uh, and I'll, I'll walk you through it and show you in upcoming videos. So if you have any questions or you're curious, then please reach out to us on the contact page of saplicity.com. Let us know what you're thinking and if you need any help or if you have any ideas or suggestions or if you have feedback or criticisms, those are going to be very welcome and I'll thank you in advance for them. Well, hey, I sure learned a lot making this video and I hope you did too. Thanks so much for watching.